Chairman of the Southern Republican Leadership Conference and Oklahoma's National Committeeman to the Republican National Committee, Mr. Steve Fair. I have won the award for being on stage the most times at the conference. <laughs> I'm the backup. I'm the guy they say, hey, we've got to use you. So I do want to remind all of you that the polling, the straw poll will close at 10 a.m. So please vote before 10. Mark Everson is the only presidential candidate with both extensive business and federal executive branch experience. In the private se sector, Everson has held both operating and financial positions within companies in the United States, Turkey, France, and Zimbabwe. His assignments range from a plant manager of a unionized beverage can factory to senior financial positions at the world's largest packaging and airline catering companies. In the Reagan administration, he held foreign policy and law enforcement positions and, and, and in the U.S. Information Agency and the Department of Justice. He has worked on sensitive public diplomacy projects, including INF deployment and the establishment of Radio MARTA. At the Department of Justice, a former Attorney General Ed Meese appointed him to Deputy Commissioner at the INS, where he supervised all agency operations, including the Border Patrol and inspectors at the Port of Entry. In the second Bush administration, Everson was Deputy Director for the Management of OMB and then Commissioner of the IRS, which achieved record, record service and enforcement results under his leadership. He also has state government experience as well. He served in the cabinet of Indiana Governor Mitch Daniels, and under Daniels, he ran Indiana's unemployment insurance and job training programs. Eberson was the CEO of the American Red Cross. He's a graduate of Yale and, the, and, and NYU Stern School of Business. He has four children, and he lives in Mississippi. Please welcome to the Southern Republican Leadership Conference stage Mr. Mark Eberson. Thanks very much. Good morning, everybody, and thank you for having me. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am uh, honored to be here, to be a part of this robust and important debate that we as Republicans are having about the future of our country. I don't think it's as difficult a debate as the Democrats are having in the contest between the words of candidate Clinton and the record of Secretary Clinton. That is far more difficult than what we are doing. I've been to Tulsa a number of times, but this is my first visit to Oklahoma City. I was privileged to work uh, with your former governor, Frank Keating, when he was at Justice, we were at Justice together. Sometimes you get the most important perspective about America if you're living and working overseas. I had just moved to Europe when the events of 20 years ago took place here in Oklahoma City. Yesterday, in the cab, coming in from the airport, I talked with the driver. His childhood friend, lost two of her children in that tragic bombing. It remains for me one of my images of America, the dignity and the courage that this city showed, that Frank Keating showed to America and to the world during that difficult circumstance. Americans are resilient and our Constitution is strong. But almost anywhere you go, you are hard-pressed to find somebody who thinks America as a nation is doing well. We need to get back on track. We need to take our medicine and get back to basics. 
We need to start winning again. We need constructive solutions for our future. So why Mark Everson? I get it. INS, the IRS, they're not the traditional platform for a presidential candidate. We tend to draw our presidents from a pool, a pretty narrow pool, of 150 senators and governors. I would suggest that it's hit or miss. Right now, it's pretty clearly a miss. I offer, as the chairman indicated, a combination of private sector and federal executive government experience. I think that's what we need. We need someone who has toiled in the private sector and understands what it takes to create jobs. I've run a factory. It's not just about talking about getting manufacturing to work. I get it. I've run a unionized factory and seen how hard people work to put food on the table. I've been in agriculture and I have worked internationally, lived internationally, in Turkey, France, and Zambia, the developing world, the developed world. In government, I've been in the situation room with President Reagan when he talked about the struggle to put in the missiles in Western Europe 30 years ago, or made the decision to engage in surrogate broadcasting to Cuba, Radio Marti. I've been in the budget meetings. I was one of five people asked to work on the creation to develop what was President Bush's proposal to create the Homeland Security Department. And I've exercised stewardship over our immigration and tax systems. I would note that on my watch at the IRS, there was no targeting. Thank you. I've had a long run, so I have perspective. We are in trying times. It harkens back to the 60s and the 70s, which I remember. I think we are in an equally tumultuous and important period in our history. I have made mistakes, and I have the perspective that comes only with a series of assignments and both successes and failures. That's necessary to have the perspective to guide our nation. So what do we need to do? We need to get back to a tax code that is cleaner and simpler and will grow our economy. We can put in a consumption tax and take 150 million Americans off the income tax rolls. If we do that, we leave in place an income tax just for the high end. That's the way the income tax started a century ago. If we do that, we can lower the rates on that income tax, and we can lower the corporate rates to get our businesses competitive overseas. It's the competitive tax plan offered by Columbia professor Michael Gratz. It's revenue neutral. It leaves the distribution of burden relatively in place. It's a solid way forward. We need to restore integrity to our financial institutions and get banks lending again. Just this week, we saw once again the lawlessness of the megabanks. 
for the first time some criminal pleas as institutions, but once again, no accountability for the executives or those who are leading these institutions. We need to reinvigorate our community banks. Our community banks are atrophying. You can't get money if you're a small or mid-sized business. I've traveled in 30 states around the country in the last two years. You're hard pressed to find someone who doesn't say, geez, if I were starting out now, I don't know if I could make it. You just can't get the money. We need a sound financial system that's gotta be a Republican plank, just like limited government and national security. Thank you. Across America, this is Memorial Day weekend. It's fitting to talk about our security interests. This president has been true to his word. He suggested that he would engage with our adversaries, and he has, at the expense of the relationships we've had for decades with our allies. It's not working. The hopes of the Nobel Committee have not been realized. <laughs> the world is not safer and more peaceful, nor is it more democratic. And now he stated also that he wanted to be a president of consequence, and he has been with the Affordable Care Act. Now he's looking, his model is Nixon, he wants to go, instead of ch to China, he wants to go to Tehran. I just don't see it. This is a nation that is fostering terrorism and still has not walked back from its stated desire to exterminate Israel. So both on a substantive basis, this is, this is alarming, but it's also alarming to me as a constitutional conservative. I am concerned that the Congress, instead of insisting that this, this landmark development be treated as a, a treaty requiring two-thirds consent from the Senate, we backed ourselves into a position where, in essence, he'll be driving the bus, the president will be driving the bus, and he'll only have to get one-third support to prevail. That's an abdication of constitutional authority by the Congress. My fourth point, you can see my six-point plan in, at my website, Mark for America. My fourth point is about spending control and entitlement reform. We need to reform our entitlement programs now before it is too late. The deficits have come down, true enough. They're down below 3%. But in, as people in my age cohort get older, they'll come up again, and CBO says that by the mid-20s, the debt as a percentage of GDP will be way past the point of no return. So we've got to make changes now. I do not favor tax increases on, on the high end, but I would means test the benefit programs and make other changes so that we can sustain our youth, and yes, can invest in our defenses and rebuild our Navy and do the things we need to do. We need to act now. We can't wait. My fifth concern, my fifth point, is about immigration. Again, I ran, I was the number two and ran the operations of the INS back in the Reagan days. We need to change our legal immigration system from one based on family unification to one based on those who can contribute economically to our growth. We need to control our borders. That doesn't mean only physical security down at the border, fences. It also means visa control, and an understanding of who is likely to overstay. We need to control the interior enforcement and put in E-Verify. 
which requires the authentication of the right to work when someone applies for a job. If we That is really the most important thing we can do. I can tell you that, having been at the INS. Once we've done those things, or as we do those things, then you're left with what do you do with the 11 or 12 million people who are here? I would like to turn this argument on its head. I believe we need to reinforce the American tradition of assimilation. It's critical to our path forward. If someone has been here, they've been here illegally, yes, but if they've been otherwise law-abiding and contributing, then I would suggest that we should provide the path to citizenship. We need to do that because we've, we've lost our tradition of assimilation. We are fracturing as a people. I've lived in Turkey. I've seen Turkey go from secular Islamic to more purely Islamic. I've lived in France. I've seen the stakes. I've seen the consequences when you don't have assimilation. We need to reinforce that tradition of assimilation lest we follow Europe into incoherence, chaos, and grave division over how to deal with radical Islam. My last point is constitutional governance. I have a record of implementing the law as written, not as I might wish it to be. No one else who will stand before you or who has can say that in the context of the federal government. My record is clear. That's what I'll do as president. The presidency has significant powers, but they are limited. Secondly, I believe that politics have intruded into Oval Office decision making. I've served in two very different administrations. Six years under President Reagan and six years under President Bush. And I can tell you that by year three, way too much attention up and down the line is paid to re-election politics. So I am running for but a single term. Thank you. And I will seek a constitutional amendment to bind future presidents to a single five or six year term. We need credible solutions to our problems, solutions that can be embraced by all Americans. I don't believe that money can buy this election. I've been campaigning in Iowa where I have an office, and I can tell you, the people in Iowa and New Hampshire, they believe that they have a say about our future. So I'm optimistic about our political processes. But I'm asking you to help me out. I have told the travel ball team in the fourth grade in Pascagoula, Mississippi, that when I'm elected, they can practice on the South Lawn. <laughs> yep. They asked, they're, they're encouraged by my candidacy, and they asked, and I've said yes. So please help me out. As a recovering IRS commissioner, I am not asking for your money. I am asking for your vote. Thank you.